Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Follow Him. My name is Hank Smith. I'm your host. I'm here with my pure in heart co-host, John, by the way. Hello, John. (laughs) You are pure in heart. My kids have a better adjective for me. It is ordinary. That would be okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm here with my ordinary (laughs) co-host. John, by the way, the kids are all yes, finally. That would be dad. Yeah. We want to remind everybody that you can find the podcast on social media. We have an Instagram page. We have a Facebook page. Our wonderful Jamie Nielsen runs those. So come on over and check out all the extras that we have there. Uh, if you want to watch the podcast rather than listen to it, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to go to our website, followhim.co, followhim.co. And please take time to rate and review the podcast. That really helps us out. Hey, John, uh, we have a guest here uh, that is renowned for uh, her knowledge of church history. Tell us who we have with us. Oh, I'm so excited. I told uh, Kim, my wife this morning, hey, we've got Susan Easton Black this morning. She said, oh, my favorite church history teacher, but don't tell her that because I had others too. But uh, (laughs) so glad to have her back. She taught at um, Church History and Doctrine at BYU for 32 years. First woman hired as a full-time faculty member in the College of Religious Education. I think they just call it Religious Education now. Received the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Faculty Award in 2000. Was the first woman to be honored with that. She is a popular speaker, prolific writer. She's one of those that can speak without notes for, for days and days. I think she has a photographic memory, you know. Um She's the mother of of three. She's currently married to George Durant. They've served several missions together, including a season as writers for the church curriculum department. I don't know who wrote this, but that sounds very Doctrine and Covenants, including a season as writers for church curriculum department. (laughs) She's been part of the Doctrine and Covenants Central team. I hope people know about Book of Mormon Central.org and Doctrine and Covenants Central as well. These great websites. She's authored more than 130 concise biographies, as well as a series of insights from each section. And recently was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Latter-day Saint Publishers Association. Um, And I don't know, have you counted... Uh, all the books that have you written that you've written. I mean, I think they have an entire wing at Library of Congress for you, <laughs> don't they? Oh, I, I don't think so. I think uh, John is a professor. Uh, we were always told you had to publish or perish. <laughs> and I was the one professor that took it hard. <laughs> <laughs> I have a wing at Goodwill, but not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. But we're we're so glad to have you. I know that our listeners will be excited that you're back as well. And thank you for being with us again. Oh, you're welcome. It's a treat. Uh, Susan, I am so excited because at the heading, we only have one section to study uh, today. It's section 124, and it's the first section given in a place called Nauvoo, Illinois. And when I saw this, I thought, I've, we've got to get Susan uh, on the show because... I've been to Nauvoo, Nauvoo with you. I've seen your love for it. And I'm hoping our listeners can can feel th- some of that as well. Uh, tell us, uh, back up, section 123 is 1839. Section 124 is 1841. That is two years between sections. Yeah, let's back up and tell us. Tell us what, how, and when, and what happened to get us to Nauvoo, Illinois. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, Hank. Anyways, uh, just great to see you again, yeah. and John, too. So if we back up to 1839, we know that uh, many of the saints who had fled from the extermination order in Missouri went to a place called Quincy, Illinois. And there they were assisted. uh, Joseph Smith describes it. Uh, He said he could have gone toe to toe with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob if it had not been for the charity, the goodwill, kindness of the people at Quincy. But once we were there uh, in 39 for um, for a few months 
In May of 1839, a conference will be held, and the decision at the conference is that the saints would now go up to an area that Isaac Galland and others owned called Commerce. So the very first Latter-day Saints to leave, then from Quincy, and to come all the way up to Commerce, your 40-plus miles, depending on which road you take, right, was Joseph Smith uh, and his family, and they arrived on May 10, 1839. So once they're in Commerce, you start to see many of the saints that had gone to Quincy moving up, others had gone to Iowa moving up. We can find them as far away as St. Louis moving up, some still in Kirtland, make the decision to also move up. So between 39 and this revelation in January of 41, you have uh, thousands of saints now head up to a place called Commerce that Joseph will eventually rename Nauvoo which uh, means a beautiful situation, and truly it was for a while. Hmm. And when they when they got there, what made them choose that piece of land versus, you know, somewhere else? <laughs> well, uh, somewhere else I think might have been expensive. Right. <laughs> for uh, Isaac Galland, he was willing to trade properties that we'd had in Far West and other places in Nauvoo that we'd been, or other places in Missouri that we had been forced to abandon. And so basically, for no money down, uh, they're able to move up there and with signing uh, land contracts, land properties. Uh, Sidney Rigdon was a big signer, Joseph Smith also. We, we moved to that area, but it was not desirable. And part of the reason is part of the land is a swamp. And so uh, this land, if we were to look at it historically, we'd say it was once, of course, what they called Indian territory. We'd say Native Americans. And then you start to get settlers moving in, our first being James White and his family, who named it Venus. And uh, you realize that's a great name and it attracted a lot of men. If a man's going to go west <laughs> to new land, he typically goes alone. And then if he likes what he sees, then he goes back and gets his wife and sweetheart. And sometimes they're actually one and the same. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> so James White goes, he calls it Venus. Men move there, but uh, the swamp made it very difficult. And uh, when they were there, they built two-story houses thinking they could get above uh, the smells of the swamp. And uh, the problem was they suffered from swamp fever, uh, and uh, we know it was malaria. And you take the word apart, mal-air, and easy to get above the bad air, you build a second-story house like uh, the homestead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just build up. You just build up, but pretty soon they're sick, they leave, and, and then come these entrepreneurs like Isaac Galland that, uh, well, they, they created kind of what you call a paper town. They actually drew their town out where they had four ports, they had a big canal coming down the, the middle, and their plan was they would take these pieces of paper, go east, and at that time, and probably still today, some of the really rich people in the United States lived in Connecticut with the idea they'd, they'd sell their land to the people in Connecticut who wouldn't know it was a swampland, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, such a deal. Get, you know, buy something out here on the Mississippi. Well, uh, it doesn't work because there's, remember, the run on the bank in 37 that so affected the Kirtland Safety Society. And then the state of Illinois had a run on the bank in 39. And suddenly entrepreneurs like Isaac Galland and others are looking for where can we dump this land? And who are people desperate enough that Joseph says, no better place presenting itself. I now go to commerce to build up a city that will be a light unto the world. The first time I visited Nauvoo, I thought, I assumed swamp means it's at the same level of the, the river. 
and you're going up a hill out of how is this swampy and the swamp evidently didn't come from the river right it came from springs right right there's a lot of springs under navu uh, navu's built uh limestone and uh water runs down from the bluff onto the flatter portion uh you do get flood water i mean you see Nauvoo now, and uh, to get there, many of us cross the dam down by a place called Keokuk, right? Yeah. And uh, then right outside as we come up to Nauvoo, we can see that Nauvoo is a peninsula that juts out into the Mississippi River, but um, that by forming that dam, they created out of the Mississippi River a lake called Lake Cooper, <laughs> and, uh, and so a lot more water uh, than the saints would have seen. I mean, I, I think with spyglasses, you could actually see across to Montrose at the time and see two islands that are now submerged due to uh, the lake effect. Oh, okay. So the river would have been a lot smaller. Yeah. And the swamp wasn't the river being high. The swamp was runoff from the bluff and springs or whatever. And so they had to dig these uh, these ditches to drain everything. Was that right. job one? And so, um, yeah, job one, <laughs> you go, boy, I'd, I'd like to be one of the first to arrive in Nauvoo. <laughs> and so uh, definitely <laughs> uh, the assignment was uh, dig ditches. And uh, almost like you're digging ditches so you can have little tributaries. You can control the water now as it heads to the Mississippi. And leading that effort will be the, the 70s. And eventually, Navu will have 35 quorum of 70s. I mean, it just, but, uh, but it was dig those ditches. And eventually, they'll, they'll move to public works like the Navu House and Navu Temple Music Hall, yeah. that kind of thing. And I think, isn't it true that by the side of the road, you still see the, the ditches on the north-south road there? Right. If you're coming down Durfee Street, kind of the main street that will lead up towards the temple today, Right next to the Nauvoo State Park, you can still see remnants of the ditches. And having been there last week, uh, they need to mow. (laughs) 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 Otherwise, uh, ditches fill in and pretty soon you're you're really back to that swamp. Yeah. You were just there last week, Susan? I was. (laughs) So the elders quorum is for moving people and the 70s are for digging ditches. Okay. Okay. 70s. Yep. That's how it was at first. (laughs) Um, so Susan, um, it's January of eighteen for, uh, of eighteen forty one when we get this revelation. What's happened that even spurs this this certain revelation All right. here? Well, as they come into town, you realize you've got uh, you've got to drain the ditches, um, put in your houses, put in your gardens, your shop. Uh, you know, next to your house, your barn, and and basically everybody's a farmer. And so uh, some people say, well, Joseph Smith orchestrates and is the architect of Nauvoo. And I go, well, when they're all farmers, they can't all live together. So if you looked at any given map between 1839 and 41, you can see Joseph Smith has 23 communities on one side of the Mississippi, and then on the Iowa side of the Mississippi, you've got 15. So between all that, you have all this going on. But then the question comes, we're now to January uh, 19th of 1841. When can you count that uh, the saints and Joseph Smith would actually be living in Nauvoo and not out on his farm? You'd say the winter months. <laughs> and so uh, January 19th, uh, Joseph Smith, and we don't know the location that he was at, but Joseph Smith and Nauvoo will receive a very long revelation from the Lord, which takes 145 verses. And that's our section 124. And it's it's the longest section, isn't it? Well, I think you could look at section 76. There are a few that could kind of rival it. Could compete. But yeah. for this time period, for sure, it's the longest. Uh, Susan, I know uh, we're going we're gonna to talk more about the revelation itself, but I just want to hear a little bit about your experience in Nauvoo. I, I know that you uh, have a home there or had a home there, which you donated. Um, but uh, what, 
What do you think about Nauvoo? Why do you love it so much? I've, I've, I've been there with you and you can almost feel it kind of coming off you like a, a, <laughs> it radiates off you, a love of this place. Uh, what, why do you well, love it so much? Well, okay. Um, I love Nauvoo. I've served four missions now in Nauvoo. I've written scripts. I tried to find all the people that lived in the different communities. Um, so that was a mission. I've served a mission for a year in the temple there. I've done the song and dance on the stage, um, helped set up their lands and records office, you know, so you could say all of that and had a house there since 2005. Um, how do I feel about Nauvoo? I, I actually think it started for me. I, I took a church history trip with my favorite professor at BYU, uh, Milton V. Backman Jr. And, uh, you know, we, I went through Missouri with him and we got to Nauvoo and he just lit up and, uh, the crazy thing, so did I, and I'll, I'll always be grateful for that. And I found myself doing so much research in Nauvoo and got tired of the hotels and the, you know, rent something for a week. And I go, that's it. <laughs> you know, I'm going to make this a more permanent. And, um, you'd say, I, I love the people in the past. I've written about, I think every person that walked the streets of old Nauvoo from their land properties. Did they do baptisms for the dead? Uh, were they a member of the church? Did they join the reorganized church? I, anyway, I just, uh, I just have loved it. And if you were to say, how do I feel about the current people in Nauvoo? Let me just give you one example from yesterday. I had a, a moving van company going to stop by my home and bring some things to Utah, right? And they were late, and a friend sat in my home for over an hour waiting for them. And then when they arrived, uh, she asked if they'd eaten, and they hadn't. And she went home and got food and brought, brought it back to them. Uh you know, those kind of neighbors are hard to come by, right? And uh, I, I love the people at Nauvoo. This last week, I gave a couple of talks. And one night, uh, we went over to Annie's Custard and found it was closed. And I slammed on the door, you know, let me in. And, and uh, you know, Helen opened up. And I, want, I go, I need to eat this, this, this. And she would not allow me to pay. Now, uh, that's that's when, when you know... Um, You've got, I have some just amazing friends there. And I think in Joseph's time, the Lord picked up and took the best of the best. And uh, I think it's still the same today. So I, I love the current people in Nauvoo as much as I have the ones in the past. All right. I can't imagine how um, Annie's custard is going to get bombarded by people saying, Susan says we don't have to pay. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, well, I hope they tip really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could I have the Susan discount? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hey, I wanted to ask you. I, I think I remember once uh, just throwing out the name of my fifth great grandfather, and that you uh, knew exactly who it was that I think was endowed in Nauvoo. His name was Samuel Alexander Pagan Kelsey. Yep. Does that ring a bell? So I know you can see behind me. Mm -hmm. His name's in there. <laughs> That's actually a better sight, but you're, you're seeing that I'm sitting uh, in my library, which I think is actually the biggest room in the house. And where you see those blue books, they still just keep going. And there are, uh, well, there's 48,000 pages. And it's uh, of the people that had known the prophet Joseph with a real emphasis on those in Nauvoo. And... Uh, you know, I've said, uh, why would I do all this? And I've said, you know, if I thought my husband was funnier, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> you know, I just, I just had some free time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 48,000 pages because I had some free time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And John, that brings up a great point. If people will open up their family search app, you can actually go to a thing called Map My Ancestors, and you can see if you had relatives Some in Nauvoo. Nauvoo. Yeah. Yeah. When I go there, I had two relatives that lived in Nauvoo, George Washington Clyde and John Wooten, uh, both uh, in Nauvoo, buried there. You know, you know, the prophet Joseph Smith said that um, there would be people that would come along after him that would take unusual interest in his... Uh, 
in his generation and time and his people. And I think obviously you two have, I don't know if you'd call it like just a passion, but uh, the love for the people, it doesn't mean that they all stayed faithful. But when they were on the scene, <laughs> they all made a contribution. And uh, I think sometimes, you know, we, we, we get after people that don't, don't hang in every minute of their lives. But uh, I think uh, they, they were there and their contribution needs to be remembered. Yeah, and there's just there is something about that place. I love going there. I love taking groups there, John. I know you do too. You, you come around that bend and up towards the temple, and oh, you're just there's nowhere like it. Hey, it's a sight. You know, I think uh, we we all say sorry, John. That you know we we go to different sites, and I'll ask, do you feel the spirit of the Lord uh, in Nauvoo? Even on their missionary vans, it says spirit of Joseph. <laughs> so you want to ask, did you, did you feel the spirit of Joseph? And, uh, I've, I've had an occasion to read all the dedicatory prayers from the little bakery to the, uh, to the Jonathan Browning gun shop to the Wainwright. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And it's so interesting, even though you can read Say in the bakery, you read about Lucius Scoville and his bearing children and the wedding cakes and the cost of all that. But before they're all said and done, they're dedicated to the memory of Joseph Smith. So whether you're looking at the Women's Garden by the uh, Nauvoo Visitor Center or you're way down the street at the boot and shoe place, uh, memory of Joseph Smith that... And uh, it's interesting. It's it's not just the memory of Joseph Smith. If you began to look at dedication dates, your most consistent dedication date is always in uh, June, and it's around the martyrdom. So Nauvoo is a it's a restoration place in memory of Joseph Smith, and what's it in memory of uh, the martyrdom that he sealed his life with his testimony of the Book of Mormon Doctrine of Covenants. And Doctrine of Covenants we're studying this year. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, John, you were going to say something about uh, Nauvoo coming around that bend? Oh, I just, uh, the first time I ever went there, Hank, you were probably in third grade or something. I don't know. But um, <laughs> <laughs> there was, uh, there was The Saints the, had just left, right? Yeah, John? this I is mean, right. I was, I was like, bye. You know, <laughs> the, no, there, the temple was just grass but there were like four stones marking where the corners would have been and and so for me seeing that and having it affect me that it was gone and then coming back uh later and seeing the temple fully finished was just a, really a wow moment to see it to see it back there again and I can I'm sure Susan will remember when exactly when did President Hinckley make that announcement? I remember a, an audible gasp okay. when he announced it. <laughs> and, okay. and when did we finish it? All right. So, um in April 1999, I'm sitting at home, I'm watching conference and uh <laughs> wearing sweats. I'm no dummy. I know my name's not being called off. You know? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm sitting, I'm sitting home and, uh, it's at the very end and, uh, President Hinckley is thanking everyone for their talks. And then he starts coughing and I'm saying to myself, and before he coughs, he goes, I have an announcement to make. And then he coughs and I'm saying to myself, somebody get him a drink of water. I mean, if there's anybody's announcement I'd like to hear, I'd yeah. like to hear his, right? <laughs> mm. And uh, then, then he says, I'd like to announce we're going to rebuild the Nauvoo Temple. And suddenly for me, just tears. Anyway, uh, you, you might enjoy this. When conference uh, was over, I got a call from the, a friend at the Nauvoo Steak Center that said their stake president, Darrell Nelson, who now owns the fudge shop in Nauvoo, that uh, he wanted her to call me and asked when I, what went on the rest of conference. And I said, I'll tell, but you, you got to tell me what, what happened when the announcement was made in Nauvoo. And she said, some started whistling, clapping. Others got down on their knees or like praying. And I go, well, what, what are you doing afterwards? And she said, we're all going to that depression that John talked about, where you had the stones and you had the circle in the middle, uh, 
you know, on the circular staircase and where the baptismal font had been. And she said, we're going to hold hands around that, that lot, which is on four acres. And she said, we're going to sing the spirit of God, like a fire is burning. Wow. And, um, after that, uh, it will take almost six months to get approval from the Nauvoo city council for there to be the construction to go forward. But then construction goes forward and Nauvoo had never seen the like, you know, Nauvoo struggles now to be a town of a thousand people. And suddenly you've got Jacobson, Layton construction. <laughs> They're just rolling in with big trucks and, and uh, eventually you get a, uh, oh, you, you get the open house and over 330,000 people toured that open house and then you get, uh, it's now coming time for when will it be dedicated? And I can remember friends in the Joseph Smith building, we'd run through and we'd say, April 6th is going to be dedicated April 6th. And we go, no, no. And, uh, you know, and others are saying, no, May 15th priesthood. And you'd say, when was it dedicated? June 27th, martyrdom, 2002. And uh, to get a seat in that, in the building, for the dedication, uh, well, I would have done anything. So in this case, I took general authority wives <laughs> back there, showed them the sites and guaranteed a seat for the <laughs> June 27th, 2002. And I had said, hey, even if I'm sitting on the horns of the oxen, I just got to get in. <laughs> and uh, I ended up pretty much nosebleed upstairs, you know, but uh, got to be in a ceiling room. And President Hinckley, it was just so amazing to me. You know, you've got men uh, singing from the choirs, uh, his tabernacle choir, that singing Praise to the Man, which was the funeral eulogy given by W.W. W. Phelps there in the corners. And then uh, President Hinckley, when he stands up before he dedicates that building, he says, uh, I want to tell you about a man named Thomas Ford. I remember and this. Okay, I don't know if I was the only one that just practically jumped out of my seat, but... I have read a lot of boring books in my life, and I've written even more, right? But, uh, but uh, Thomas Ford wrote a book called The History of Illinois. And in The History of Illinois, you read and read, and then you read he has three fears. And his three big fears were that someone, there would be someone who would keep a name alive the name of Joseph Smith. So thank you, Hank and John. You're telling the world. <laughs> anyway, I love that. And all those missionaries out there return. And then his second fear was that place names uh, like Nauvoo, a little tiny town out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, your closest airport, St. Louis. I mean, you know, I mean, it's going to take you three, four, who knows how long, depending how many times you stop. And uh, that place names like Nauvoo, uh, Palmyra would be as familiar to people around the world, such as uh, Bethlehem and Gethsemane, Gethsemane, I can say this. And then his third fear, he was fearful that there would be a great speaker who would one day link his name to Herod and Pontius Pilate. And who was that great speaker? I mean, you could tune in all over the world, do the... Hosanna shout in stake centers everywhere. And here is this just wonderful man that's about my size, right? Uh, Gordon B. Hinckley now stands up and says, I want to tell you about Thomas Ford. And the whole world learned that he literally turned his back. It's not like he shot the gun that killed Joseph, but he made it possible by his total inept uh, I mean, just, uh, he just didn't, didn't fulfill his assignment. So, um, wow, to be there and then to listen to President Hinckley dedicate that building and then at, to ask people afterwards, walk Parley Street and uh, change it to the Trail of Hope. In other words, it's a Trail of Hope, we're heading west, was just uh, one of the most spectacular days of my life. I got to read this to you soon, Susan. I have it on my phone here. He says, it is to be feared, this is Governor Ford, it is to be feared that in the course of a century, some gifted man like Paul, some splendid orator, who will be able to buy his eloquence to attract crowds of thousands who are ready to hear and be carried away, he may command a hearing and may command in succeeding, breathing new life. 
and make the name of the martyr Joseph ring as loud and stir the souls of men <laughs> as much as the mighty name of Christ himself. And then he lists off these names, Sharon, Palmyra, Manchester, Kirtland, Far West, Adam on Diamond, Nauvoo, and Carthage may become holy and venerable names, places of classic interest in another age like Jerusalem, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, uh, Calvary. And he says, this author feels degraded by that reflection, you think? Uh, he says... Um, he says he will be hitched on the memory of Joseph Smith, meaning himself. Uh, I don't want to be hitched to the memory of Joseph Smith. So, I mean, that it, Governor Ford became a, a, a bit of a prophet there uh, in <laughs> <laughs> saying, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, those names are are important to us. Every one of them. Um, yeah. And I remember you told me a story about uh, President Hinckley at Governor Ford's grave. Uh, do you remember telling that story, Susan, that he would he would pace in front of that grave and get. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I think, uh, for, for president Hinckley, um, his, his love of history of church history sites. I mean, you just start to look and, uh, you just can find him at, uh, dedications, rededications all over the place. And he, he had strong feelings about governor Ford. <laughs> yeah, he did. And, uh, yeah, you you want to be on the good side of a prophet, you know, all of us, uh, John and Hank, we get, we got to make good choices here. <laughs> I just remember when I came back there, I couldn't. I think my family commented on it. I couldn't stop shaking my head. Just the there was this temple. We were back. I I mean, I couldn't. All my seminary, all, you know, that we'd got kicked out of Nauvoo and they were painting it and they had to leave and it was back and it was gorgeous. And I just couldn't, I can't look, we're in Nauvoo. So that was, I'm so glad you relived some of that for us, that dedication and everything. We, we only had one picture of the old Nauvoo temple, right? And so suddenly architects and those that are designing it are desperate. What should you know, what should be included on the inside, outside, you know, colors. And uh, we know that Joseph Smith's red brick store, where they had the first endowment, that the inside of the store was painted with buttermilk and ox blood. And so it was red. And so uh, as I'm talking with the architect trying to, you know, give ideas, I said, well, of course, the inside is red. And uh, if you've been in the temple, you quickly notice I have no power or influence. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, having having served in there a year as a you know as a missionary temple worker, um, that I can assure you, I haven't found one red red building or one red room in the entire building. Yes. <laughs> well, the other thing is that uh, when they had the wooden font. Uh, and that's the one that was really used for baptisms, right? When they had the wooden font, the oxen were all wood, and then the bowl uh, that they hold up was all wood. And so everything was wood except the in, the ears of the oxen were tin, T-I-N. And so I said to the architect, even though you're doing stone, I want those tin, T-I-N ears on the oxen, so it gives it like this bling, you know, a bling, a bling was big, you know, it kind of really pop out. But once again, no power influence <laughs> and obviously it didn't happen. But I still think it would look great. A little chrome oh, wow. on those uh, yes. oxen. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I was reading in the Saints book about, you know, the Kirtland Temple. Did I, did I recall that the roof was red and the sides was, were blue? Was, or something uh, right. bluish. Right, the roof's red, and then yeah. the window casing's blue, and the door's olive green. And the green. door's green, and it's just, you know, there's, I, I think that clothes go through fashions, and so does uh, architecture and colors, but. Right, so so how it used to be back then, you know, you'd, you'd build a log cabin, and then you got money coming in, you build a clapboard house, and then. But how you knew somebody was well-to-do is that they would splash their buildings with color. And nowhere do you see it better than that John Johnson farmhouse yes. back in Hiram, Ohio. The the floor in Joseph Smith's bedroom, you know, the blue, red, green kind of looks like a checkerboard. Yeah. And and the revelation room, is it is it orange trim? I mean, there's trim around the fireplaces that are 
right. the way the wood is kind of varnished or painted is kind of swirly and you're like, oh, that's very interesting, <laughs> you know, when you see it. Yeah, the, uh-huh. Whitney, the Whitney home is bright yellow. Yeah, that's yeah. A- yeah, so you can tell we need to. We're now all what gray or beige, and you're like, what? Yeah, where, where <laughs> need to we lose splash our homes. Hey, if we if we can afford some paint, let's. Uh... <laughs> let's uh, oh, let's go bright green. <laughs> I'm sure my wife will be really excited about that. Well, let's go into some of these verses. I love how this starts with this idea of a of a proclamation. You want to lead us through uh, how this revelation begins. Uh, For me, I love Joseph Smith, and I love the boldness as the revelation begins, and especially uh, as he's saying to do a proclamation to all the kings of the world. And then as he goes forward, he tells them to awake. (laughs) uh, You're like, okay, kings, what, what are they to awake to? And they're to awake to the needs of the daughters of Zion. And to bring their gold and silver and basically to help build up what is known as a corner stake uh, of the church, then Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, And um, wouldn't that be great (laughs) if they had and if they would do it today? Uh, Nauvoo could sure use it. We'll just kind of let you take the show here. Um... Susan, okay. walk us through the revelation verse All right, by verse so, what you want to see. <laughs> so looking at the revelation, you've got the first 14 verses is Joseph Smith and a great desire uh, to send a proclamation to all the kings of the earth, to the presence of the United States, to governors, to all rulers, to let them know we're in Nauvoo. And then it switches from there. Uh, to talk about men that Joseph had known who had a great integrity. And of them, only one was alive at that time. So you get Hiram Smith, his brother, a man of great integrity. But then Joseph, uh, the Lord refers to two others, David W. Patton, who died at the Battle of Crooked River, and Joseph Smith Sr., who had died in 1840, and uh, but all three of the men having integrity. Could you imagine anything better said about any of us? <laughs> that uh, you, you could count on us no matter the situation, and, and I like that. From there on out, uh, you get there's much talk about two buildings, and when I come on with you, it seems like I always get to do buildings, and I, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so the, the Nauvoo House and the Nauvoo Temple, and then, um, then Hiram Smith be, becoming officially or, ordained a patriarch, and I, I like his being a patriarch. Hiram was so serious about being a patriarch that he set aside three days a week that you could receive your blessings from him. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I, I think of uh, Hiram Smith. I think of the literally dozens and dozens of patriarchal blessings he gave from 1841 to 44. And then at the end of the revelation, it goes through the leadership of the church, starting with the first presidencies down to the deacons quorums. And uh, that's where you get so many names in section 124. But I think uh, for us, the part that would perhaps be the most interesting and and long lasting, I know you want to hear about the presidency of the deacons, right? <laughs> okay, so but, uh, <laughs> all right. But uh, I think uh, probably if we talked about the Nauvoo house and uh, a little bit more about the beginning part of the Nauvoo temple uh, might might serve our listeners well. So uh, on this, uh, Nauvoo House, uh, it's so interesting. You can uh, walk around the outside and see it today, but it isn't a place that the typical tourist goes. But um, you'd say, let's say you wanted to do a family reunion, had a youth group, uh, some kind of uh, friends all getting together. It'd be a wonderful place uh, to rent and and you're right down there by the Mississippi River. You're right across the street from the homestead. 
But this Nauvoo house, looking at it anciently, we know that Joseph Smith will call then four men, and uh, the Lord names them. You get a George Miller, a Lyman White, a John Snyder, and you also get a Peter Hawes. And their job is, and they're all mentioned in section 124. Verse 22, George. Oh, okay, they're George Miller's verse 20. Okay. Okay. And then keep going. You'll find Lyman White, John Snyder, and Peter Haas. And they're like trustees for the building of this Nauvoo house. And what I think is so interesting, sometimes when you get the people at the top, <laughs> they then assign out and they continue sitting at the top, right? And are not actively involved in, say, the building or the getting. But if you were to look at each one of these men, you can find them going out on missions to be able to get money, to get lumber, whatever's needed for the Snobu house. So I like them a lot, actually. Uh, so this they form an organization, and they form it one month after the Revelation in February 1841, and it's the Nauvoo House Association. Between these four men, they estimate that what, um, what is going to be the Nauvoo House has a possibility of being worth and uh, to be able to build $150,000, which is big money at the time. You get John Snyder, he goes all the way to England to collect money for this. <laughs> and he comes back with over $900, I think is pretty impressive from the English saints that are trying to save up their money to be able to come to the United States to be able to uh, help with the building of this building. Hmm. And Susan, for those of us who've never heard of the Nauvoo House, what is it exactly? Well, it was supposed to be an L-shaped, kind of like a hotel, where there would be a resting place for kings, queens, uh, people like us, <laughs> to come and to sit and to contemplate the great things of the world. What, what I think is so interesting, as they try to raise the money, they did like subscriptions like stocks. And you could put in as uh, $50 up to 15000 but no more. And uh, it's interesting. The only people that could buy stock in this, you think of, hey, you could buy stock. But the only people that could buy stock were those who believed the Book of Mormon to be the word of God and those who believed Joseph's prophecies. And I don't know of any other stock company <laughs> <laughs> that would have this caveat uh, that says, uh, you know, to buy stock in our organization, you, you've got to know the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith, the prophet of God. Now, uh, they will actually begin building. And it's quite a large facade. The first floor is ultimately to be three floors. But the first floor would be rock and then the other two floors brick. But as uh, time went on, we know at the death of Joseph Smith, we know they were up to almost the window line. Uh, but then things stopped and the Nauvoo house goes into the ownership of Emma Smith. To, uh, for Emma, they continued building in 1845. And it's going up even higher with the bricks. But then Brigham Young is, uh, he is, he's very concerned about, we need a temple. He's concerned he's going to take the people west. And he wants a Nauvoo temple uh, finished. So he takes everybody off public work projects. Even those uh, drainage ditches we talked about, <laughs> everybody's off. <laughs> you're not working on the music hall. You're not working on what we call the cultural hall. You're not working on the Nauvoo house. That temple needs to be completed. So as a result, uh, the Nauvoo house is a shell of a building. It's L-shaped. And when the saints go west, there's no building on it. And, uh, okay, okay. But I think one thing I should say that kind of backing up, when they put the cornerstone, the southwest cornerstone in the ground, and they're about to dedicate this site, 
Joseph stops the whole thing. And it's really, it's at the October uh, conference in 1841. And he stops the whole thing and he goes, he goes, wait, I have something to put inside the cornerstone. And he runs across the street back to his house, the homestead. He comes back after he's kind of checked to make sure he thought it was all there. And he puts in uh, the Book of Mormon uh, uh, manuscript. And they then seal it up. They build. But the problem was years later, uh, Emma's second husband, Louis Biedemann, has made the decision. He will pick up all the stones in the brick. (laughs) <laughs> and he will then build what we call today the Nauvoo House, Riverside Mansion, the Biteman House. We have a lot of different names for it. But in doing so, he unearths this cornerstone, and he finds that the documents, including this Book of Mormon manuscript that have been placed in that stone, uh, there's mold, uh, you know, much is disintegrated, And uh, so if you were to look today, (laughs) uh, since, uh, well, it's since, I think it's 1909, that uh, this house has been owned by what was first known as Reorganized Church, now the Community of Christ. But we know in the cellar of that house, uh, that's one of the places, well, Joseph was first buried, as well as Hiram. So significant things on the Nauvoo house. Let's see if I can summarize this. Um, one, it's a revelation from God Two, there was a huge effort to build it. There was a huge effort to acquire the needed money and you could, um, you could buy stock, but only if you believed in the book of Mormon and Joseph's revelations, we know that Joseph was buried there for a short time until September then, uh, 44. And we know that workers were taken off. Because in Brigham's mind, it was more important to finish the Nauvoo Temple. Hmm. Can you kind of finish the, um, the, your thought about that Book of Mormon manuscript and where it ended up? Uh, for Louis Spiderman, he started giving away parts of it to different people. Ugh. And <laughs> <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, you want to see a treasure I found? Take part, right? And uh, then eventually you get uh, Franklin D. Richards is back there, uh, choirs, and eventually you get uh, much of it then acquired by our church. And then trying to pull it apart to see what's in there. I think the great work of Royal Skousen is to just be cheered, you know, his ability to to look and find and and uh, the church's history department uh, archives trying to preserve what what they're what there was left of it. And uh, too bad on that occasion, Joseph goes, wait a minute, <laughs> and runs back and gets it, because obviously we would like to have seen it all kept intact. Yeah, this is the original manuscript, the one that Oliver yeah. Cowdery penned in, it you know, his Fayette handwriting, in Harmony. Right. Yeah, not, and the printer's manuscript, which is the second manuscript, it's fully intact, right, Susan? It's this original right. that... Only right. about a third remains, which you're, oh, you put it inside a rock, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> did you put it inside a, a bag or did you? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and especially down by the Mississippi, yeah. I've, uh, I've gone back there several times where it's flooding and we're all sandbagging and you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, that, I've thought that several times like, oh, don't put it in there. Susan, uh, say what you will, I guess, about Joseph Smith, thinking that, you know, nations and and people all over the earth are going to go visit the Nauvoo house. Uh, But a hundred and how long now, years later, there are people from all over the world that go visit Nauvoo. It just took a little bit of time. Uh, Okay, from literally all over the world. And there's now hotels and bed and breakfast and other places uh, that you can stay. But it's been uh, serving back there. I've been amazed how many times I've met people from Japan, Russia, and Orient. I mean, they're just, uh, they're coming from all over to see a little town that, wow, since the saints left, since the 1860s, uh, were, well, okay, just as an example, just that whole Hancock County in 2010, they did a census, and in the whole county, which includes Carthage, 
there was only one town named Elveston, you see on the way to Carthage, and it was the only town that gained in population. And they went from 150 to 151 because a woman had a baby. <laughs> and so <laughs> so you, you look at this area, and yet because Nauvoo is talked about all over the world, people will come and uh, they see that beautiful temple yeah. and the spirit. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the nations of the earth are coming to Nauvoo. Maybe not as early as Joseph thought they would, but uh, they but are They're coming definitely now. coming, and I... In my mind, it continues to be a light unto the world. Yeah, me too. Because of what you get there. I mean, you get um, baptisms for the dead. Uh, families can be together forever. Um, the endowment, uh, ceilings. Uh, we trace all that to now. Please join us for part two of this podcast.